You're watching BBC World News. Michal Hussein meets in association with Shangri-La Hotels and Resorts. household name in Indonesia while she was still in her teens, releasing one successful music album after another. Angun had it all. Then the desire for bigger pastures took her to Europe and a longed-for international breakthrough. But has her image at home paid a price? Born in 1974 to an artistic family, Angun Chipta Sasmi grew up surrounded by Indonesia's intelligentsia. Her musical talent was recognized and fostered from an early age, and by 19, she was a full-blown Indonesian pop star. But she abandoned fame and fortune to travel to London in the hope of an international career. After a year of increasing poverty and little success, she moved to Paris, where everything fell into place. She quickly released her first European album, Snow on the Sahara, and became the first Indonesian-born artist to top music charts internationally. Angun is a UN Goodwill ambassador, and this year she represented her adopted country, France, in the Eurovision Song Contest. Angun, welcome to Michelle Hussein Meets. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. I have to say, I find it pretty staggering to think of releasing your first album at the age of nine. How did that happen? Uh, actually, quite naturally. Because I was, um, you know, being an Indonesian, where in Indonesia you basically uh, born with music. You hear music right now, like for example, if you if you wake up at seven in the morning, you watch TV. There's a, a, already a, a a rock band playing live at seven in the morning. So it's it's music is very very present. But even by those standards, you were born into a particularly cultural, artistic family. Exactly. My father was a book writer, and 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 uh, his friends were like poets or sculpture or, you know, movie directors. Uh, they used to come by at home and, and, and my uncles, as I call them. And so I, I had a very rich um, childhood full of music and paintings and books and and, and everything that, that, that are children. But was it, was it your idea to start um, singing and indeed start performing so young or, or was it suggested to you by your parents? I believe that I started singing as soon as I know how to make noise with my, <laughs> with my mouth. So my, my dad, my father was uh, this, this, this person who, who recognized something out of a person. Uh, so I think he just guided me. To, Did he push you? To the, not push me, really guide me to the right path. Did you still have friends of your own age or were you largely mixing in adult company? I, yeah, of course, because, you know, I went to school, uh, I fin uh, my father made sure that I finished, you know, I, I went to Catholic school, so with nuns and everything. And um, he, was, he was very adamant to the fact that I had to, you know, have proper education. And then all other things, is the bonus. But at the same time, you were, you were launching your own record company? That was when I was 19. Uh, and it, 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 was, um, it was sort of like a, a logical um, step for to me. To give you more control? Is that, is that what it did for you? Yeah, yeah. And you enjoyed that? I did, yeah, still. And for me, freedom is, uh, especially in music, when you don't have that kind of freedom, then it's more about business. Because then you're not honest anymore and I have problems with that you were so hugely successful by the time you were you were 1920 and then you made this very striking decision to leave Indonesia yeah. striking because you were at the top of your game but still young and you had so much ahead of you in your own country mm -hmm. why leave because I thought why not now though Indonesia is such a big country but everything happens in Jakarta so it makes it very tiny and uh, I, w I, I had 
big dreams and my father you know though he he didn't have driver's license he never flew he never took um, a plane uh, he he travels with his mind with his books and and he always said go and see the world you know but it was a it was a tough phase wasn't it because mm. there you were this very successful pop star in Indonesia and you arrive in Europe in in London I think yes how did you find it rainy London very cold and <laughs> but difficult professionally no, no one must have known who you were no no one and I had to learn everything from scratch because the system were not made the same not the same language not the same business we're talking about business really and uh, and I had I, I really had to have um, t I mean I think making the right uh, uh, when you meet the right people this is when you know that you can probably go somewhere and that didn't happen till you got to Paris no. yeah <laughs> so it was it was Paris that really gave you a, a European breakthrough exactly it was um, and and I was really sad actually because I, I I mean I decided to leave Indonesia to go to London and then but it didn't happen then did you question your decision? Essentially, you, you were living a pretty hard life in Europe compared to all the fame and adulation that you'd had in Asia. And then also like the fact that it was real life, meaning I was alone. I was living in hotels. I had to uh, count the money. And then if I, uh, with, you know, transportations, food and all that. I mean, I have never encountered that kind of problems before in my life. But why stick with it? Because I'm stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Torian and and uh, and I vowed myself I'm never going back home before I have something so it was an issue of face of, of pride if you had come back home that would have meant that you had failed or that I had uh, it would have meant that I didn't try strong enough so you know when one door closes there's another door open somewhere no one waited for me you know, uh, and Europe is amazing because you just hop on a plane, an hour later, you'd be in a different country with different language and different culture. So I thought, why not go to Holland? There are a lot of Indonesians over there, must be easier. So, but before going to Holland, I thought, Paris is beautiful. I wanted to go. So give it was only ever meant to be a stopover. Exactly. I, I wanted really, you know, giving myself um, a nice, I don't know, weekend. That weekend, I extended to the full week and then 10 days, two weeks, and then seven years I stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so random. I, and then I met the right people. And then, Well, you've uh, certainly collaborated with um, artists from right around the world. Some of the people you've duetted with, Brian Adams and Peter Gabriel, Julio Iglesias, and also Roberto Alagna. Yes. And for this series, when we've been asking uh, people who know our guests to contribute their own messages for them, your video phone message has come from Roberto Alagna. Ah. The main challenge for Angoon, an artist who has had to make a name for herself in Europe, is actually to introduce her image, to introduce her culture, and to enter into French and European culture. Because today she sings in three languages, French, English, and Indonesian. A great quality of Angoon's is the ability to preserve her identity. She is always herself. She doesn't reject her origins and instead develops them and thrives from her interaction with other cultures. And I think that's the secret. Congratulations, Angoon. So Angon Roberto Alanya talking about you saying you haven't forgotten your origins, but some in Indonesia might feel that you have. You you attract quite a lot of negative press, particularly over the fact that you changed your citizenship. Exactly. It's uh, it's very unfortunate, and I'm really sad of that because I feel that it's not the color of the passport of my passport that changed who I am. I mean, that doesn't change my origin, my blood, my childhood, my parents, or, uh, or my language, as a matter of fact. It really, 
is a tool for me at first to be able to visit those countries because you know uh, having an Indonesian passport back then uh, and still now is quite complicated to travel the world. So over the years have you developed a, a thicker skin because people have said some hurtful things about you in Indonesia in, in the press. I mean d does it still bother you or over or over a period of time have you got used to it? Well I, I again I see it in a different perspective. I uh, those people who who said harsh things about that is because they don't know who I am and though it hurts me sometimes because uh, you know, after hearing so many things, it can only pile up and then uh, you just have to say something. I have always been very honest. But have you become more genuine. westernized over the years? I don't think so. I think um, maybe, uh, I think if you want to analyze certain things, you can always have list of, 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 of things to be found and that says that, oh, this is not very Indonesian or this is very Western. But I don't go by that book. Like when, when, when I arrived in Europe, um, I just go by what I know, what I feel right. I don't say, uh, oh, we should never do this because our education didn't teach us how to. You have to adapt yourself. You move with the times. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk more, Angun, in a moment about your time in France and particularly how you ended up um, appearing for France in the Eurovision Song Contest. But before that, we'll take a short break. We'll be back in a moment. Hussein meets and today I'm meeting the Indonesian born singer Angun. Angun we've been talking about how difficult it was for uh, you to break in uh, to Europe. You said once that you had to change from being an introverted real Javanese woman yeah. to what you are today. Yeah, what did you I mean? Meaning that you know a real Javanese would accept everything. Uh, that is in my education. Y you know in Indonesia we didn't they don't teach us how to say no. We say no differently. We say maybe, we'll think about it. We get very creative in the negative answers. But uh, so... So you had to learn to be tougher? Is that what you mean? I, yeah, I had to learn to, um, to be a fake Javanese. <laughs> to, yeah, to really stand up for what I wanted, you know. N not really to take no for, for an, as a negative thing. Really to turn that uh, that around. And has that been good for you, do you think? Yeah, I believe so. I, 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 I think it helps me a lot in, uh, again, I could have just flo flown back home after London, but no, I decided to go elsewhere and try somewhere, someplace else. And, and you it released, paid off. You, you, it paid off. You released uh, more and more music and you ended up uh, being chosen to represent France yeah. in the Eurovision Song Contest. Exactly. That was huge. Huge honor. Did you think of it as a, so it was a compliment from your, from your new country? Exactly. Exactly. And I took that as, um, I mean, out of those people, out of real French people, they chose me. And I certainly present um, the new face of France today, which is, you know, made out of mixed culture, uh, French, uh, like French people, uh, French speaking people that come from all over the world. I mean, I, I learned the language, I learned the culture. You learned and the language from scratch. You, did yeah. you speak any French before? No, not at all. And I had no French. reason <laughs> to speak French before. So do you feel French? Uh, I feel like I'm genetically modified <laughs> <laughs> by myself. No, I'm, I'm very much Indonesian in my way of thinking, but uh, I'm French now because uh, of, of this language and because uh, I'm married to a French guy. My, my daughter is half Indonesian, half French, and I also feel Canadian because I used to live in Montreal. So I feel like there is a part of me and there is a part of those countries that I've visited, that I lived in, in me, 
You said it was a tremendous honor to be chosen for Eurovision, but it yes. wasn't the happiest of experiences. You ended up coming close to the bottom. Yeah, well, the bottom was uh, <laughs> Engelbert Humperdinck <laughs> from England. So it's, it was uh, actually, um, I, I think I got it for the wrong reason. I went there for, to the fact that um, I was so happy to represent my new country so very honored I believed in my song and then I forgot one tiniest thing that it's a competition so you enjoyed it too much you mean or you relaxed too much I because I never thought music as a competition to me uh, who can say that this song is better than that one it's our personal sensitivity but did you take your failure as a reflection on you or no, what not was it? Really. Who, who made a mistake? I don't think we made a mistake. I, I think, uh, I mean... You were 20 second. Yeah, but I don't think that as a mistake because when you see the number two, uh, the, the runner-up, was uh, this group of grandmas from Russia <laughs> saying, singing, party for everybody, dance. <laughs> Come on. And, and they act on stage they have this oven, they're making food on stage. It's very folkloric. And they came number two. So I don't know, uh, we're not in the same thing here. We're not on the same page. Will you ever do that kind of competition again? I, now I have problems with the word. I mean, I truly, uh, went st even when I was there, us artists, we were, you know, high-fiving each other, we were having drinks, we were listening to music. The competition were more, uh, on, you know, between the countries, the delegations, and, and, and the fact that there were re really hardcore uni um, Eurovision fans. And uh, I, I just, uh, I think I underestimated the whole thing. Well, let's turn to our audience, because I know many people have uh, questions did you have one you'd like to ask? Out of the three languages that you've been singing in, English, Bahasa, and also French, which is the one that you feel most comfortable singing in? And what was it like picking up French and having to learn a new language and singing it as a performer? Most comfortable language is definitely Indonesian because I don't think about it, I just say it. And uh, even now, uh, I count in my mind in Indonesian, I, I think in Indonesian before translating it into English or, or, or French. Singing in French is a whole different... Um, I really have to learn how to sing again. Not, not for the technique-wise, but uh, to the fact that I have to sing with the right, with a proper accent. You so must have had to have a lot of help understand. with that. Did, did, yeah. did you have a, a singing coach I had who singing really coach. helped you in French? Exactly. But then in the same time, you don't want to take out that accent that they call charme. Très, très charming. <laughs> the exotic yeah, foreign that's accent. That's what in they French. say. But yeah. to me, it was more like a handicap because some people might find it charming. Some people, they just. Ugh, ugh. And again, um, I think as an Asian, we get by easily and we look cute doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to uh, the, the lady in the, in the row just behind. Salut, Jano. Uh, my name is Jano. Hello, Jadur. And uh, I wanted to ask you a question about your work as an ambassador for microcredit. Yes. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I, I started my work with the UN with the microcredit. Uh, it was back in 2005. For those who don't know what microcredit is, is that uh, is an a access to, to money, financial access. Small to amounts people. of money Small that make a money. difference. Exactly. For people who... Um, uh, People who actually live in rural area, who don't who don't have bank accounts, who 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 cannot read, who can't even sign, make a signature, uh, they uh, microcredit make that um, possible for them to loan money, small amounts of money, and to start business. Was your role to raise awareness of the fact that the financing was out there for women? I was one of the spokesperson, and as I see throughout, um, you know, various programs that I. Um, involved with with the UN every time we put women we, we give them access to technology to finance to to food to uh, position like key positions you can make sure 
of the success of that program. And because simply women are natural managers, you know, we're multitasking our way through the days and, you know, taking care of the kids, uh, taking care of husbands, um, salary, and then the education. And <laughs> yes, sometimes the husbands are more work than the children. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> more questions? Bonjour. Yeah. Bonjour. Ah, bon voilà. <laughs> Hi, Ingrid. Uh, hey. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank uh, you. I, so you, you've lived in France for, for a while. Uh, France has changed a lot over the past years, I would say. You've been a foreigner, now you're French. Uh, but I would ask you, do you think that France is still a welcoming place for foreigners at the moment? I've seen the re a real change in, uh, in people's mentality um, as to they're more open to the language, to foreign languages to English, for example. And that, to me, is thanks to the, uh, the fact that, you know, with the social networking, um, now you can touch, you know, the world. Well, Indonesia actually is a country that has, you know, experienced tremendous change in the years since you left. Yeah. You know, today it's such a booming economy. It's one of the economies that, um, that Asia and also the world is, is looking to in the future. Yes. Is it somewhere that attracts you back? Now that I have uh, my daughter, yes. Yes. Because it's you'd like to bring her up in Indonesia? I, um, I want her not... I want her to know about half of her blood. Not only three weeks every, every year during our vacation. I want her to be uh, young, to know more about her inheritance. I mean, it's, uh, it's very, very important to me. There's also the kind of value that I have, that I found that I, in Indonesia, but I, we don't have it or we have it differently in Europe. Uh, sense of security. Um, the meaning of the word family. Uh, all that is, uh, is very, very important. Yeah. Well, hang on, there's so much more we could um, talk about, but sadly, we're out of time. Thank you so much for thank being my you guest for having on me. Michelle Hussein Meets. And thank you for watching. This is the end of the series, but I hope you'll join me again next year. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>